All right, so I'd like to welcome you all to our Kaitiaki Speakers Forum. I'm really, really grateful um, that you've all joined us today and uh, really looking forward to um, hearing what you have to share with us. Um, my name's Asher Anderson and I'm one of the trustees of Flora and Fauna of Aotearoa, um, along with Felicity Taylor there. Hi, Felicity. Um, Hi, and Hannah, Hannah Blackmore. And um, we are really about um, brave new voices and uh, you know people people finding their role as as kaitiaki and whatever that means to you and bringing that forward you know in this really um, important time of, of change and transition in our world and um, so we hope to kind of hold these things more regularly there are so many amazing people doing incredibly important work and the more that we know about each other and the more that we can connect um, the more powerful our impact is going to be and um, yeah so welcome and um, might just start with a very very short uh, Fatuki Karakia that I learnt recently and um, that I think is, is really beautiful and it goes like this um, Manaki Fenua, Manaki Tangata, Manaki Te Ao and it basically means nourish the land, nourish the people and you nourish the world. So um, welcome everybody. The format that we're gonna use for this is to basically go through one speaker at a time to give you a, around seven minutes. Um, and I'll let you know when you have one minute left um, and just to share whatever it is you want to share, you know, would you introduce yourself? Maybe tell us what motivates you and what you've been working on and what you're passionate about. And then at the end, after everyone's had a turn, we will um, see if there's any questions. We, um, and I invite all of you to ask questions of each other as well. And, um, and after this, I'll um, send out an email to everybody just to make sure that you can connect with each other, you know, if, if you choose to do that. So yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Nora, Nora Shayeb. I'm going to switch us over to um, speaker view so that you're, you, will, um, you, you will be the biggest face. And then when there's one minute left speaking, Nora, I will switch it over to gallery um, and so that you can see me and I'll just let you know when your time's up. So I'd like to welcome you, Nora. Would you um, like to take yourself off mute and, and uh, yeah, introduce yourself? I thought I did that already, but can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, good, good. So yes, I am Nora Shad. I live on a 150 acre bush reserve that I have become the guardian of 18 years ago. And this place has taught me everything that I know now. I've arrived in New Zealand 30 years ago, but it was only through this bush reserve here that I actually started to really see what's happening here. And in the meantime, I also have learned a lot by uh, talking to other people uh, who are working in conservation. By now that word has become, has acquired a sour taste in my mouth because a lot of people who work in conservation have blinkers on when it comes to the impact, first of all, their own impact on, on the planet and second on how they go about what they call conservation. I'm seriously concerned about this predator-free campaign. I think it will destroy what little is left of our wildlife, the way it's done. I have come across some information that I wanted to share with you as food for thought. And I'll start with a lady that I, a scientist that I've met, uh, in Tasmania quite a while ago who was working uh, in conservation and was hired by the New Zealand government and occasionally came over to do some projects. And she said to me that possums are actually not what they're made to look like. They're, they are not as harmful to our native bush as uh, it is claimed they what they do do is in the winter when there isn't much food in the bush they go into the pine plantations and chew on the, the young sprouts of the pines which they love and then of course the pines don't grow straight as we know when you prune a tree it grows the other way and so uh, she said it's actually quite a big um, propaganda act of the pine forestry to make the public think that the possum is the evil 
and to make the public pay for our pest control pest um, that they should be doing to protect their own plantations. When you think about it, it does make sense because I don't know of any plantations around here who are doing anything about um, their own trees. They let us do it. So that's one thing. And just not long ago, two, two years ago, maybe I was talking to the ex security manager of Auckland, who has worked in conservation for 40 years. And he said to me too, possums are not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is the destruction of habitat. And that is happening through us people. It's not happen happening through any animal. The, the birds are not getting decimated mainly by predators. And by predators, people always think of possums and, and stoves. Uh, they never talk about cats and dogs. They never talk about us. We are the main predator really on nature. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, and there was also my submission to our council is that um, we have to stop shifting the blame. We have to accept our own impact on nature before we attack anything else. And we have to keep in mind what the consequences are of what we're doing. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, I have some more information if anybody wants to get in touch with me at some later stage. Uh, and needless to say, I mean, oh, I forgot to say, and yeah, I'm the Northland Toxin Awareness Group. And of course, pesticide spraying is having a huge impact on the bird life. It's killing birds left, right, and center. So uh, we need to first look at how we go about saving a world that doesn't need saving. It needs saving from us. Nature knows what she's doing. I firmly believe that. And we will never be able to turn back the time to predator free because if if we were to do that, we would have to go as well from New Zealand. New Zealand didn't have any mammals and we are a mammal. So um, yeah, that's really everything I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, under time there too. <laughs> Great, cool. Thank you, to, um, thank you to you for sharing that. Yeah, I think many of us share your concerns about predator free um, and that ideology. Um, so Nairi's joined us. Nairi, are you there? You wanna switch your camera on and your mic? Hi, kia ora koutou. Hi Nari, thank you for joining us. Um, we, we've got um, seven minutes each and I'll um, let you know when you've got one minute left, but we're really keen to um, hear what you have to say and would you um, introduce yourself and let us know where you are, where you're, um, where you're at. Hi, hi. Uh, kia ora, ko haiti ki te maunga, ko te tauwai te awa, ko karangahape te wharetupuna, ko te tauwai te marae, ko matangirau taku kainga, ko te whanau pani te hapu, Ko Ngāpui Nui Tonu Rawa Ko Ngāti Kahu, uh, Taku Iwi, Ko Mā Tātua Te Waka. Uh, nō reira ko Nāri Pōta Manua Hau, uh, ko Rea Manua Taku Hōrangatira, uh, ko Rusty Rawa Ko Mahi, Oku Mātua uh, me Oku Whaia. Um, taku Tūpuna, Ko Tupi Tupi, uh, He Rangatira Tino Rangatira i a Whangaroa. So, um, yep, that's who I am. That's my pepeha. Uh, my sixth great grandfather was the fourth signatory on Te Whakaputanga, which is the Declaration of Independence for our country. Um, I hail from a small place with a big heart called Whangaroa, and um, very proud to be from the from this place. Uh, lately, I have been on multiple journeys from killing our whenua, trapping to our tamaraki, our rangatahi, and um, working in the space uh, throughout all environments because you can't fix one thing without uh, balancing the rest. Um, I was more well known throughout stopping uh, the Department of Conservation from dropping 1080 here in our beautiful harbour. Um, and they haven't come back to do it and they won't be coming back to do it. Um, also on that journey, uh, have put a rahui down on our scallop bed. Um, and that has been quite successful, been doing some work with Niwa 
as well to get the scientific support around what they see as um, their science and our science. But Matauranga Māori led this out uh, mainly um, with all the toxins going into our awa, then down into our moana. It is affecting everything that's happening in our taiao. Um, the journey this far has um, become very uh, relevant to uh, tangata whenua, to mana whenua, that um, specifically here in Whangaroa is what I can speak for is um, we need to push back on all levels, uh, whether it be mental health, uh, whether it be what's been used in our environment, um, it all shares the same, if not first and foremost, our, our taiao um, relevance to what we do here as human beings on this planet. Um, I've found a model that works, um, that will keep everything in line, and, and it's quite simple, mana tua, mana tangata, mana whenua. But because people have put mana tangata first, um, economical value has overcome uh, the way that we treat our planet, ourselves, and everything around us. Uh, so, been working very hard for our people to practice the way that our tupuna um, passed down to us to put our environment first, and then from that we can understand um, and balance properly what our environment is doing and we work around our environment not our environment works around us so um yeah that's pretty much all from me asha uh you'll see me on social media on the news all of it um but yeah thanks for listening everybody and um keep up the good fight awesome thank you nari yeah really appreciate what you're doing um in the whangaroa harbor you know and it's it's bringing attention you know rahui really is a tool that we need to be using um a lot more yeah thank you very much awesome so i would like to uh kim i'll invite you now um kim would you like to introduce yourself and um share with us a bit about what you've been working on and um yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> can you see me? Yes, okay, wonderful. Um, good morning. I'm gonna be a little bit less, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit more formal, I guess, cause I'm not used to doing these things. <laughs> um, thank you for having me, my name is Kim Fairhurst and I'm the administrator for um, the Facebook page, uh, Non-Toxic <clears throat> uh, Neighborhoods in New Zealand, uh, Northland. And I'm also a student, um, I'm on break right now, but a student of um, a naturopathic college, nat uh, New Zealand naturopathic college. So I'm learning uh, my main focus is on health, <clears throat> on uh, nutrition. I, I do want to become a nutritionist. So. My, my take on, you know, everything that's going on with, with um, I'm just going to focus on gly glyphosate right now. That's kind of, I can only focus on one thing at a time. Um, as a herbicide, it's just shocking. The information that I found online about it is so misleading and such big lies. And I was perplexed about why everybody doesn't think that it's bad for you in this country and all over the world. And now I know why, because they completely don't admit a single thing that is wrong with it. They, th they, they blame it on the sufferers, uh, what do you call it? This, the, um, <clears throat> they blame it on things that are added to it after, like adjuvants and um, sufferers, I can't say that word. Surf, you know, the, how, how it spreads out, the surfers since, oh my gosh, sorry, I'm getting a bit, tongue tied here. Um, so yeah, there is just absolutely nothing about how bad it is, no matter where I went, you know, only only the like alternative websites obviously have a lot about it. And there's a lot of, of research that has been done, you know, and studies that have been made and, and actually released into the medical mainstream, but they're considered not true. They're all debunked or whatever you want to say. Um, it's just ridiculous. It's just they're just basically denying, just like with cigarette smoke, that it there's anything wrong with it whatsoever. 
and they go all until until the charade has to end, which is now because the lies are coming, you know, out, and people are demanding truth, and we're not settling for being lied to anymore. And you know, it's pretty obvious there's issues with with glyphosate because it kills things, not just plants. It kills everything. So yeah, it's a very it's a very um, sorted complicated issue. Um, what I want to do is focus on what it is. Um, glyphosate is named after two components, um, active ingredients, they call it, um, which is glycine, which is an amino acid and phosphate. Obviously that's, um, phosphate is used as, you know, fertilizer, but it's not, you know, natural by any means. But, um, so I want to focus on the, um, the glycine part of of the um, glyphosate because it's important to understand what it is. Um, so I'm just gonna read what I wrote down. A short history of glyphosate. <laughs> glyphosate was first discovered to be useful as a, an herbicide in 1971. By 1974, it was in use and registered to the EPA in the USA, which is their Environmental Protection Agency. It is registered as n glycine 3 <laughs> three um, protons on it or whatever. I think hydrogen. Um, the active ingredients for Roundup are glycine, an amino acid, and phosphate, hence the name glyphosate. <clears throat> glycine is one of 22 amino acids the human body needs to perform specific and extremely important functions in the body. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Our bodies utilize um, or synthesize all 22 amino acids to create a huge amount of different proteins in our body. Enzymes are a protein our body uses. Oh, sorry, that's, I need to. <laughs> Anyways, um, the amino acid glycine is classed as a conditionally essential amino acid because it needs two nutrients to be present to create glycine in our body. Serine, another amino acid, and vitamin B6 combine to make glycine in our bodies. Glycine is extremely important to have in our bodies. I will read from my, my book, my amazing Bible book of nutrition, <laughs> what glycine does in the human body. Glycine <clears throat> is important in brain metabolism where it acts as a neurotransmitter and has a calming effect. Glycine is a simple amino acid needed for the synthesis of the hemoglobin molecule collagen and glutathione. Glutathione is another amino acid which is key in detoxifying your body through your liver. It's very important. Um, it also can be converted to creatine which is used to make DNA and RNA. Glycine is useful in healing wounds and treating manic psychological states or problems of muscle spasticity. Um, it also stimulates the growth hormone, uh, hormone release in your body. Uh, the more, uh, more recently discovered is the role of glycine in detoxification, especially by the liver. So the glycine that is used in, in glyphosate is not identical to the one that our bodies create. It's a much larger compound, I guess you would call it, because it's more than one molecule. But um, so when your body is exposed to glyphosate, at one more minute, um, it tries to utilize the glycine, but it doesn't. It's not able to uptake it because it's too big as a molecule and it completely messes up any kind of um, reaction after that. So um, yeah, I would like to be able to go into more detail about that in another time, but I guess that gives you a start about like why, you know, like basically things like Parkinson's disease, you know, depression, all these things that, that can happen after being exposed to glyphosate, is, it, that's the reason. So it's kind of a key to, um, like one of the key things to understand about what it does. Sorry. <laughs> I just have so much I can say about it, but I guess I'll just have to wrap it up. <laughs> that's, cool. It's, that's cool. Thank you very much, Kim. I mean, it's just a, just a, a short 
introdu introductory, you know, but but yes, um, I think we do need to delve into these topics a lot more. And for those that aren't aware, the EPA has just now put out a call for further information from all New Zealanders, um, including industries, um, regarding the use of glyphosate in this country. And it's, um, they're, they're, they're basically saying that there is no new scientific research that they have come across that um, indicates that it's not safe. <laughs> so um, now that this oh, consultation is open until August, so we all really need to be making a big push on it um, and, and getting in touch with them and letting them know because they are, they're effectively ignoring international research, you know, and going for industry um, research that is, has inherent bias. So yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Um, that's great. Excuse me, Asha. Excuse yeah. me. Sorry to interrupt. I have an appointment today, a lunch appointment, so I'm having to leave. I'm sorry that I have to leave. I've also got a cake in the oven to take with me. So um, I wish I could stay longer, but I need to exit now. No and thanks problem. for doing this. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. We are recording this, so we'll put it on our YouTube channel. We just get permission <laughs> from, I think, Nairi. And um, yeah, thank you, Janet. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to now um, invite Claire. Claire, would you pop your camera on and um, yeah, welcome you to introduce yourself and share with us um, what you're working on. Um, Atamarie, ko Claire Bleakley, taku ingoa. Um, I am president of G Free New Zealand, and I really, really do love all the submissions. Uh, that we made to the Northland Regional Council, as well as the Far North and uh, Kaipara. Um, I guess for me today, the value of what I need to talk about is because most of us are highly concerned about our flora and fauna, but also um, as, um, was it Nora said, just that we are, our own worst enemies. But, um, and and the, the stuff that Kim have said and all of this, it's all so relevant to today. And what concerns me the most is glyphosate has been shown to cause many, many problems. And Bayer, as we know, is suffering a many billion dollar court case to uh, help with those people that have suffered under its use. Um, but what is happening is instead of our big multi-corps addressing uh, the pesticides, they're actually still going with the kaupapa of killing our environment, our insects, our pesticides. And they're introducing a new um, a new pesticide which has a genetically modified double-stranded RNA in it. Now, this here is going to be used specifically within, I think, the glyphosate uh, or the Roundup. And what it's trying to do is it does not alter the DNA, but RNA is what reads the proteins of the DNA. And Kim just touched a little bit on that. So when we need, when we do a function or need an enzyme or anything, our RNA goes into the DNA and finds the appropriate protein that's tucked into one of our chromosomes, reads it off, takes it back, and it's prepared outside of the, the nucleus of the DNA in what they call the reticular endothelium or the Golgi apparatus or one of those things. We can all read up on this. So really to keep it very simple, this RNA is trying to compensate for the weed resistance and the insect resistance that has occurred through the overuse of pesticides. Mostly um, we now have, I think, uh, 87 different formulations of glyphosate in New Zealand. So they, what happens is, is they bring in the glyphosate in a uh, concentrated form and then they make it up because it's off patent to their own formulations with their surficants, 
and their um, uh, detergents and stuff. And those are what we call your adjuvants. So DSRNA is now an editor and it will get into the cell and it will modify or change the behavior or remove a part of say the plant or the insect that has made it resistant. The concerns that we have through G Free New Zealand with this kind of effect is that microorganisms can take up this RNA and they can actually um, change their behavior. They can become much, much more pathogenic or um, virulent. Uh, they can also get resistance, but we do not know how the RNA is going to affect us as humans when that plant we eat. Because with GE genetically engineered or transgenic or gene editing, what is happening is we're eating that food and that food is our fuel to live on. And it's our insects, it's our trees, it's our whole flora and fauna. We all rely on healthy soils. And if those soils aren't healthy, they can actually modify us and our health. And that's what can um, focused on. So what we need to be very, very aware of as we are moving forward is that we thought that maybe lockdown would help us look at regenerative organic agriculture at our flora and fauna and really start protecting nature. What we are noticing is big corporates are calling their pesticide products plant protection. So now they've kind of captured the word protection and you will find that everybody's going around going, we've got plant protection products for you. And that's what farmers are called, are being told. And this DSRNA is highly concerning because it has been shown to modify the behavior of bees, our pollinators, but also we always forget, but we've got tons of native insects. And they are what pollinate our native flora and flora. And if we get rid of those, we will lose that because they're the only ones, like the Kodomiko, only has one, one or two native pollinators. Our, our exotic, our introduced pollinators are not there. So I just raise, uh, I really, really thank you for letting me talk. It's very short. And if you go to our website, G Free New Zealand, you might find more about the concerns we have with GE in our environment. But um, thank you all. As, as Sorry, just quickly, if we did introduce genetically modified organisms, we would also introduce pesticides and incredible overuse of pesticides. So thank you for letting me talk. And... Uh, Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Claire. Yeah, yeah, very, very um, interesting and concerning. And, and I do also see the, um, the move for uh, changes in agriculture, and some of them are very, very worrying because they're heading us to, in that opposite direction of what we need to go. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and I will I will create an email um, probably early next week and include links to everybody's respective Facebook pages and websites so that we can connect that way as well. Um, thank you. All right, now I'd like to invite you, Des, Des Watson, to um, share with us a bit about his journey and uh, what he's working on. Des is on mute. Des, can you find the unmute unmute button? Yay. Right. Awesome. Yep. You're on mute again, Des. Not sure why. Right. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Uh, so my name's uh, Tiz Watson. Um, I've been travelling around New Zealand uh, since the 1st of January 2019, uh, collecting rubbish from uh, our coastlines and around uh, waterways and off the sides of the roads, etc. Um, what brought me to um, start this little mission um, was just uh, prior years um, being on the internet more, social, me social media, uh, following conservation groups like Sea Shepherd and um, a few other groups and stuff and just, um, you know, say 10, 15 years ago, um, seeing the impacts of what all this rubbish and plastic is doing to our environment, our oceans, uh, these beautiful creatures like the whales that are ingesting it and stuff. So uh, seeing the, uh, you know, posts of... Um, animal conflict with plastic, with stuff wrapped around animals and just, yeah, really gruesome stuff. Uh, so that kind of impacted me. Um, I grew up in a little place called Westport um, down in the South Island there. And I was quite a keen surfer as a young fella. Um, I'd go, go down the tip head and go surfing. And I remember um, back as a kid and seeing this rubbish and the rocks and stuff. So. I think it might have been the year prior or maybe a couple of years prior to me going off on my mission. I went back to Westport and uh, thought I'm going to pull all that rubbish out of the uh, rocks down the tip head. I think I filled something like 13 rubbish bags of uh, mainly plastic out of the rocks, which had obviously been chucked in there from people driving down the tip and chucking stuff out the window. Um, rubbish washing up with the waves and getting stuck in the rocks. Um, yeah, so I was uh, working as um, a sea cleaner for the eight months prior to me um, doing my journey. Um, my father passed away about 11 years ago and um, the sale of the family house um, come a couple of years after dad passed away and um, so mum had invested um, this money uh, from the sale of the house and um, that was in part of their inheritance so um, she decided that she's going to give us um, get us kids the money um, but early so that, that was all good um, I planned to build a tiny house on wheels uh, with my 40 grand and um, so I got the money and I started working out the cost of uh, this and that and I uh, didn't kind of pan out uh, for my 40 grand. I was just building a sealed shell. I had nothing to tie it with, nowhere to park it. So um, yeah, that didn't pan out. And I'd been following this lady, um, Kitty Daniels for a couple of years and she's a um, earth warrior. Uh, she's in Rotorua and she'd been going into streams and creeks and the amount of rubbish that she was pulling out of uh, these creeks and streams where eels and little fish and it all runs to the ocean. And um, that was pretty, well, full on. Just like near 100 plastic bags in this one spot that she was pulling stuff out. And it was, um, so that impacted me too, um, just seeing other people on the internet, you know, doing beach cleans and stuff, and you can't even see the beach. So, yeah, I, I've been living in Rarangi four years prior uh, to me doing my journey, and uh, lived on a beach here, beautiful beach. You could see Wellington on a clear day, and um, I'd, I'd go out there, you know, maybe once, twice, three times a week, and uh, go for a walk down the beach and fill a bucket. You know, next time I'd go back, much, much the same, and um, and I started thinking, is this every beach in New Zealand? So, uh, one day at work, um, I was kind of over it, and I was just thinking, um, when I went back to work after lunch, and um, this thought just popped in my head, I'm gonna um, quit my job, I'm gonna uh, buy a van and a trailer, and I'm gonna travel around New Zealand uh, and pick up as much rubbish as I can from our coastlines, just to 
try and do something more because I always felt that I could do more. And um, yeah, so that's what started this uh, journey. So this is, I'll just give you a bit of a look. This is, I don't know if you can see it so well, but uh, this is my little house. It's on a um, tandem trailer. It's custom built and I've been living in here uh, the whole time. So I've got a fridge fridge freezer down there. I've got solar panels on the roof, a little bit up there. It's very compact and it does get frustrating. But uh, that's how I've been living for the last couple of years. So um, I knew my 40 green wasn't going to last me very long uh, with no income coming in. So I set up a give a little page called um, well, I call myself Kiwi's Clean Aotearoa. And um, yeah, so this is me. This is how I've been living. And um, yeah, just it's taken me near two and a half years to try and circumnavigate the coastline of New Zealand. So the bigger areas, I spend about two weeks. Um, little areas, maybe one or two days, and I just keep moving to the next spot. And um, yeah, to date I've collected about 28 tonne of rubbish. Um, I have the odd people come out and help me and stuff, but uh, I've inspired quite a few people, I think, and uh, that's what it was about. And um, some beautiful people around New Zealand doing some uh, great work. DTEC up in Auckland, the group, and uh, Carol Lamb, Tidy Taupo. I uh, got David from Mahia, uh, Clear Vibes Tastes. Um, yeah some wicked people out there doing stuff awesome thank you des yeah that's amazing i mean i think that that's um that's next level stuff you know building yourself a tiny house and traveling around and and just getting out there you know and i know you've inspired a lot of people and the amount of rubbish that you've collected is just phenomenal you know so thank you for doing that it's it's something we all need to be doing and it'd be nice to see uh the keep new zealand beautiful campaign revived again i'm pretty sure we used to have that as a you know why not have a day a, a special day every year kiwis clean aotearoa day would be mm. awesome and then make it every day <laughs> thank you des that's yeah. that's really yeah. cool all right i'd like to invite uh, samar ocean wolf cyprian to be our next speaker um thank you samar i'll let you introduce yourself and and share with us <laughs> Thanks, Asha. I'm on my phone, so it's a little bit shaky. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm currently not in Aotearoa. I'm currently in New Mexico, so sending all of you love from this beautiful place on native land. Um, I am the social media rep for Honor the Monga, which is a movement in Tamaki Makoto to protect the trees on Owairaka. And also, um, our people have been really involved in other tree protection around Auckland. So I think it might be helpful for me to just tell you a little bit about who I am to give some context to how this started. Both my parents are indigenous. Um, my dad's a Bedouin. My mom is from Afghanistan, from the tribes there. And what ended up happening is um, I moved to New Zealand 17 years ago. We've been living in Mount Albert a really long time. And we love that mountain, like so many people. And it's one of those things that, you know, is just, is there. You would never think that something like that would go away. And so, you know, our, our son has played there since he was born. It's an everyday part of our lives. And in 2019, I was at home and I had this very strong pull to just walk up the mountain. And normally I would drive up because we have a little dog. But that day it was like, no, walk. It came deeply from the body. And I did, and I saw a sign saying that all exotic trees, 345 of them were scheduled to be removed within a few weeks. And my heart just sank. And it was like, there's no way. I mean, that place is an arc. There are eucalypts there that we've since found out are endangered in Australia. There are olive trees from Palestine, from groves that have been destroyed um, in their homelands due to the occupation. There uh, is a giant macrocarpa that has native trees growing out of it. I mean, these are beings that people, so many people take solace in and have relationships with. 
And so I just went into an emotional crisis. I thought I was the only one. I got online and started a petition, made some videos, cried in them. Uh, and because I was making so much noise, some of my friends um, who were connected with other community groups in Mount Albert found out that there was a, a protest gathering um, in the parking lot. And that's where I met uh, Anna Radford, who is the spokesperson for our organization and many other beautiful people. And so now we're on 17 months. Um, the initial days were very intense. And so this plan for those who don't know is part of a larger restoration project. And one of the themes I'm noticing in some of your shares is the co-opting of beautiful sounding words to cause environmental harm to essentially make money. So um, it's been fraught, like there's issues of Mahdi sovereignty that come up with this. There's issues around the corporatization of indigenous issues too. And so we've learned a whole lot. And during that time, so many beautiful Mahdi people have stood by our side and are part of our organization. I wanna shout out to Shirley Waru, who we were hoping would be on this call. Maybe she'll be on another one. Um, she's at Otahuhu, Mount Richmond, planning a similar occupation because that mountain will lose more trees than any other. And for her, like when we use the word kaitiaki, which I know is not from my culture, so just, you know, in full respect and honor of my understanding of what I've had shared about it, it's like for her, she goes, I, I have to protect the birds. I mean, we're talking unknowable loss of bird life and the amenity values of, of two and a half thousand trees across Auckland that would go in a restoration project. I mean, I can't, you can't even fathom. The, you know, none of the, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on because we're talking 17 months of like living and breathing this, but none of the experts that, because the Tupuna Monga authority who is administrating this essentially stands in front of the council. And I have a few videos I'd love to pop in resources if anyone wants to know more, because for me as an indigenous person, it was really important that they were Maori voices speaking for this, not just me. Because one of the things the media has done is ignore that and just and call our group racist. And there have been innumerable times I've been on social media going, um, excuse me, like <laughs> you're just making another brown person invisible. In fact, many of them. And so I have um, put a lot of effort into interviews with all our Mahdi supporters, including Puroto Naropo, who's the chairman of Iramoko Marai. Um, we were essentially adopted into that hapu through a process of uru fananga because Owairaka is sacred to their hapu. It's Wairaka is one of their ancestors. So it's been a rich journey, but we're talking that, that monga, there are so many rare birds just thriving. And the plan is to take out half the trees. And so if any of you have been looking at what happened at Western Springs this week, you know, again, the words restoration, revegetation, it's taking out hundreds of thousands of native plants to get rid of the pines. And yeah, I mean, it's the emperor's new clothes in Auckland right now. And there's a lot of suspicion about the motivations behind these projects, but it's the same, it's the same characters behind each one. You know, it's the same thing again and again and again. And there's this real, interesting binary about native plants good, anything non-native bad. And the truth is like the climate's changing and the overstories that those trees provide are fundamental at keeping native flora and fauna in the city. Like we're standing for urban forests because if we lose them, we're never getting them back. And none of the experts that are touted um, to support these projects have ever made allowances for climate change. So when they say, you know, in 80 years, you'll have a thriving native forest up there, even though that's not what's being planted at all. And tons of glyphosate has been used. I mean, there's lots of resources on all this and we see it with our eyes. There's no allowance for the changing climate. I mean, most of those plants will die. And so, you know, it's it's been really painful. And I think what I wanna end this on is just, 
it's been really painful to watch Indigenous people be used in this way. It's been really painful to watch the voice of Mother Earth be silenced in this way. It's been really painful to watch just how much unresolved pain there is in society. And actually, if we look at those mountains, they're teaching us how to live together. You know, there's just, it, they're full of life from all over the world and they need each other. And so, you know, that's why we're still there. We've had, um, we had an injunction grant, uh, injunction? Sorry, my brain's going, but oh, it's gone to appeal right now. So we were protected for a while. And uh, at the moment, it's gone to appeal. So until at least July, the trees on a white oak are safe, but all the mountains are, are in serious, serious jeopardy in Auckland. So I think that's all I have to say right now. Happy to answer any other questions because my mind is just full. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you very much, Samoa. Yeah, I've been watching watching the journey from, from a distance. And um, yeah, it is incredible the way that things are being twisted around and, and backwards is forwards and, and the language that's being used, you know, um, in order to convince us that certain things are good when we know that, that the opposite is true. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and Western Springs as well, yeah. But this is this is certainly a time of awakening for a lot of people, you know, to the to the value of trees. And sometimes, unfortunately, it takes this kind of crisis to, to pull that through, pull people through. All right. Um, so the last speakers I would like to invite Felicity. I didn't have her on the poster, but we'll maybe share the last little bit and tell you a little bit about what Flora and Fauna have been doing. Um, there's two main projects that we've been working on. Um, one of them being our natural, natural Nature's Verge project. Um, so I'll let Felicity, if, if she's keen to maybe say a few words on that, and then I'll introduce the People's Inquiry, and then we can um, have some question time. Felicity. Hi. So hello, everybody. Um, uh, yes, we've been working really hard on um, Nature's Verge, basically because we feel that people in general, the population of New Zealand in general, has no idea of how harmful sprays, chemical sprays are, glyphosate, because the propaganda has been so serious and very, very well done over many, many years that the average New Zealander just thinks it's, it's okay to be used. So our aim is to start educating people um, very simply about, okay, how bad it is, but giving a solution because we've found out that there's a lot of things being, um, you can see Ash's little sign in the back. <laughs> That's what we've been doing, making up a lot of little signs and, and hoping to distribute them around the communities. And so what we've noticed is that people don't realize that they don't need to have their, their verges sprayed. Um, what we've also realized is that if the solutions are much better than always being against something, councils don't listen to complaints. Councils don't listen at all, basically, but they do seem to like a solution. So uh, that's where Flora and Fauna comes from. We, we are based on creating solutions. So the Verge, uh, the Greening of Verges, Natural Verges project is educating people to make sure that they know how to avoid having their Verge sprayed by going on the register, which is a very simple online procedure. And also putting out a little sign We've been making our own to give people, um, to sell for $5 to cover costs and to show families that their own children can make these signs and how easy they are um, and how important they are just to be put there on their verges. We've also got seeds available to be sprinkled and in all this, it makes people aware that it is a solution to being poisoned. Um, systematically um, it's you know like something that really to me every time I see it uh, you know we live I live in the Hokianga 
um, and it's the most beautiful, beautiful natural place. And yet every few months we see all of a sudden the plants around just going yellow and looking so sad. And then the whole environment looks sad. And then what happened this year was this massive fire um, risk was created because they sprayed all the native toy toy. I mean, I cannot imagine why anything native would be killed off anyway, and created these huge, huge dry areas where any little spark would create a, a, yeah, disaster, total disaster um, for our little community. So not only is it poisoning ourselves and all the people um, and all the insects and all the birds and all the fish because it runs straight off into the harbour, but it's all they, they are creating a fire risk. So yeah, our people are being that should be protected by these councils are actually being put at risk in every single way. So our little project of keeping the verges green seems to be working. And we just want to spread this word as much as we can. And because it's so simple, uh, I think that that's where the where it where we come from is creating simple solutions and people enjoy making signs, people enjoy planting seeds, people enjoy getting up in the morning and seeing their verges colourful um, and, and seeing what they've done. So what we're urging is to have this word spread as much as possible. Uh, with our little sign, we, uh, uh, we're making a little pack with seeds, a sign and instructions on how to get on the register, which you just go online to do. Um, so yeah, that's our project. And I'll pass it over to Asha to talk more about the People's Inquiry, which is a very, very important part of what we're doing. So that's Thank us. Thank you, Felicity. Thank you, Felicity. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we, um, we got a builder to de deconstruct some pallets and we got some uh, <coughs> So we've made these little signs just using resin paint and um, yeah, just getting them out there, I think is, and, and the more people that see this kind of stuff, it makes them think so. So it's really um, a, a good, fun, positive thing that we can do. Um, on the flip side, though, is is the work that we're doing with the People's Inquiry and um, Hannah, Hannah Blackmore, who's here with us today as well, is, is part of our committee for the People's Inquiry. Um, this inquiry is, is basically an inquiry into the impacts and effects of toxic chemicals and poisons on our people, wildlife and environment. So it's a broad inquiry calling for submissions from people who have been harmed, who have been witness to harm, as well as scientists, researchers um, and other advocates. And then another aspect of it as well is the solutions. You know, we, we are calling for submissions from people who are working on the solutions. But its primary purpose is to give voice to the many people who have been harmed by chemicals um, who have not had any help and who have been ignored, consistently ignored um, by health departments, by councils, um, and whose voice isn't being heard. Um, and particularly people who are working in industries like horticulture, conservation, um, agriculture, weed management, all of these areas are actually very much entrenched they're based on poison um, and that needs to change you know if we're, if we're moving forward into a more sustainable way of being if we're trying to heal our planet there's actually no way that we can keep we can continue you know pouring poisons everywhere and ignoring the the um, environmental and health impacts so um, there's a really good website that we've put together and we we are basically um calling for submissions between now and the end of August. So if you know anyone who's been impacted by toxic chemicals or if you yourself have witnessed harm, um, please do consider making a submission or letting other people know about this opportunity. Um, in September, there will be a three day online hearing. Um, that two days will be given to um, people who have been harmed to share their oral testimonies and the third day will be given to scientists and researchers um, who want to share expert knowledge. And we have an independent panel of three commissioners at the moment. Um, that's Dr. Muriel Watts, who is an expert 
expert um, in pesticides um, and has done a lot of research over the past decades and has been a, a really important advocate in that space. Dr. Tom Kearns, who's based out of Seattle, um, who's, who's working on many climate change related issues and who's been involved in International uh, Tribunal for Fracking. Um, as well as Hema Weehongi, who's an environmental researcher um, here based in, in New Zealand. You can read about them on our website as well. Um, so yeah, we, we are, we're calling for support for this inquiry and we'll be having another uh, Zoom hui probably later in May for people that are um, wanting to support us because the next four months will be a really intense push of, of collecting submissions so that we can put those forward to the commissioners um, at the hearing. Um, they will be charged with creating a report with a series of recommendations that we can then go and give to all government departments and councils. Um, you, you probably know that the EPA, I think I mentioned before, the EPA has just put out a call for information on um, you know, how people are using glyphosate. And so this is another opportunity that we really need to let them know. New Zealand is way behind. We're not li listening to international research. We have insulated ourselves and we are following industry research only, which as I said, has an, an incredible inherent bias. Um, so especially at this time, you know, when when great changes are needed in order to deal with um, some of the problems that that um, are coming up, we, we really can't uh, allow ourselves to continue down this path. So that's what it's all about. Um, yeah, I, Hannah, did you want to add anything? Hannah was a part of the first people's inquiry, which was in 2006 into the aerial spraying of Auckland. I don't know if any of you remember the painted apple moth spray campaign that happened there. Hannah, would you would you like to um, add a few words? You're on mute. Oh, fine. Um, not really. I mean, you you've uh, explained it eloquently, and just hearing everybody that has spoken this morning, the links. You know, we cannot separate ourselves out, you know, one from another. Um, and whether it's glyphosate on the curb or, or you know, the chopping down of the trees, the, the damage to the, 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 the waterways, the contamination of our water, our foods, it's all interlinked. And whether our people's inquiry can bring that all together I don't know, it's a huge ask, but the people certainly that we have currently got on board are an amazing bunch of people who are giving us their time. And, um, and I hope, I mean, just listening to all of you, um, you know, all of you have a part to play. I think some of, um, some of what you guys are going through is so valid. And I would love to hear all of you giving um, you know, submission to the inquiry and uh, outlining what can be done. Because at the end, it's like when I came here to New Zealand um, 25 years ago, I genuinely thought I was coming to a clean, green New Zealand. And it is so not. But we have this amazing potential because I think that as New Zealanders, because we are a small country and most of us know each other. You know, you can't walk down a street without bumping into somebody who knows you or, or knows somebody else. Um, I just feel that we have this potential to change the world. So thanks, just go with it. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, and I think that your last sentence there, you know, we, uh, we are changing the world, even if we don't directly see it, you know, this is, this is how things work in deep, deep time, you know, and we are part of, we are part of that shifting movement. So I just want to really thank all of you for, um, for sharing today. It was really, really, really interesting and, and, and 